Well, I was actually uh, four years old, riding on the uh, trains, which were dirty. It was really no water. The windows were closed. They were blacked out as we were traveling to the first camp. And I just remember that as we were getting on the train, these white soldiers were kind of, you know, they were kind of friendly to kids, you know, like, oh, hi, you know. Then we get on the train and we're uh, in our seats and we're told not to move unless we you know, really had to. And these soldiers would go up and down the aisles with their rifles and, and they had bayonets on them. And that was, to me, at four years old, really scary. I'd never seen anything like that. In Japan, the legacy or inheritance or land or wealth is handed down through the laws of primogeniture. The eldest blood son of the father will inherit the wealth. Japanese men who are not the firstborn, they have an incentive to now move away from their country. Her parents are second generation. Mine were first generation. You're just starting to make it in this country. December 7, 1941, is Pearl Harbor. We see this uh, yellow journalism, this uh, anti-Japanese sentiment start out. Japanese now are labeled the enemy. The executive order to from Franklin Roosevelt comes down in February. We were at the assembly center from uh, May to September of 1942. When the Japanese were first rounded up, and they were put into the Santa Anita racetrack or they put in the Puyallup Fairgrounds. Those were called assembly centers. From this area, we went to Puyallup, actually the fairgrounds. And uh, we were in a park called Camp A, which is uh, probably the main parking lot opposite the main entrance to the Puyallup Fairground. It was like, it, before a fair, and there were these... There were stalls. And there were stalls. stalls, and so there was no... Yeah. You had to sleep there. And then, they were actually detained. They were actually confined in these internment camps or, or concentration camps. I went to uh, Minidoka. But in Minidoka, I think we were in there for about two and a half years. What I remember about camp is that it was hot, dusty, windy, sandy. Actually, it's pretty amazing that we didn't get shot because we used to sneak out past the barbed wire fence and, uh, you know, like go you know, try to get down to the river and stuff to play. So, um, you had your little cubicles for each family and there was really no place to feel cool. So, I would always go underneath the bed and get right on the floor there. That bothered my mom because it was just sandy everywhere. But there was no way to get any kind of relief at all. I mean, it was just so, um, so desolate. Her parents are second generation. Mine were first generation. And the first generation is true. Everything they say about the stoicism, it's called gaman. Japanese in general have a couple, I'll call them behavioral dynamics. One is gaman, which is a stoicism that you persevere and you endure. No matter what the odds are, you never give up. You just always um, put your uh, head down and you plow through whatever obstacles that, that you that you need to overcome. Not grin and bear it, but bear it. The other is shikata ganai, the sense that you accept what is occurring. Translated into English as it can't be helped. So with the bombing of Pearl Harbor and then the eventual evacuation and then the eventual detention, because of these two cultural dynamics, people or Japanese were, were saying, well, it can't be helped. And then they're gonna let that gaman set in and they're just gonna plow through it, they're gonna endure. If you could find a job off the West Coast, then they would release you. So in our situation, my father was able to get a job milking cows in Montana. 
Now, it was possible for some of the Japanese to apply to leave the camps. They had to have employment, and they had to go much further inland. So you see folks that go to Chicago, or they might go to Montana, they might go to Salt Lake City. So we were in camp for four months, about four months, which is very short, actually. And we had some relatives in Montana that hooked us up to jobs and so forth. So my mom worked as a maid in Helena, Montana, and my father went to work at the dairy. It was a scary situation for everyone because we didn't have money, we didn't have friends, we didn't have anyone to depend on. We got out before the end of the war because my uh, father, he found work on a farm and we joined him in Eastern Oregon before we made our way back here. But there was a lot of racism everywhere we went, and um, you know, a lot of times you just were ignored when you went into a store, or ignored when you uh, tried to talk to anyone. As a ten-year-old, I remember getting uh, kicked out of uh, restaurants, you know, yeah. not being served, having dogs sicked on me, you know, when I'm riding my bicycle. I don't know, maybe I should be more terrified, but it, it's just something that kind of rolls off your back. I remember trying to go to school when we decided to stay in Montana for a while. My dad decided to do sharecropping and um, I had to walk two miles. The two miles le uh, led us to uh, Fort Shaw, which is a little town and it had a one-room schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And every day I would go and um, this one kid would always say, well, here comes that Jap girl or Chinaman Chinaman and his father was a station train master and so he's kind of big big deal in that little little town of 50 or whatever. So one day my uncle came over to visit us. I was telling him, oh, I don't want to go to school because it was just so scary to have people always be so negative around you. And he said, well, <clears throat> Jan, you got to just really tough it up and get in there and forget about whatever he's saying and just do what you have to do. I think because of the internment and all these things, uh, we become more like uh, roll, you know, you roll with the punches or you roll with the flow rather than uh, set an agenda and plan like you're supposed to. Well, so many people that were educated came back and they were not able to find jobs in their profession. Yeah. Architects, lawyers, for them having these degrees and not being able to work professionally, you know, it must have been just, you know, really tough. When they came back, they just basically started over again. My father was uh, one of five siblings who came to this area. And, uh, and so, you know, we had a very strong uh, support system all, all along. Every first Friday of the month, I meet some classmates of mine who I've known since camp. They were in the fourth grade with me in camp, and uh, we went to Washington Junior High and Garfield High School. What's remarkable about the Kumasaka family is that um, they struggled like all the other families, but uh, many of them uh, were able to go into college, uh, become doctors and dentists and lawyers, and that was pretty amazing when you realize that when they were teenagers, they were in camps, and they had no idea what kind of education they'd be able to afford. At the second generation, which is pretty amazing, you know, yeah. how, yeah, we always joke that we needed a lawyer, we have a lawyer now. <laughs> Maybe the, I don't know, maybe the next generation of poets, you know, philosophers. When the Japanese were forced into internment camps, there was a sense of embarrassment. And because they have this sense of you don't bring shame on your family, they didn't talk about it. They, they buried it. They, you can think of it as a whole cultural repressed memory where they just, they blocked it out. People would not talk about it. My father said he, he didn't want to talk about it. It was so, yeah. so awful that even to talk about getting redress was just something he, he never wanted to talk about. The urgency of what happened here needs to be really proclaimed. We need to hear their stories. Many of the uh, people that were just children uh, when this happened are now very old and we're losing their stories. The story is very important in terms of the civil liberties and the 
justice that was done without due process. It's our story and we need to tell it now before it's really too late. In the 70s, and the 80s, as redress became a topic, there was more more stories came out, there was more visibility, there was a lot, a lot of different stories that, have, that had not been told. Only now as we've been talking about our stories um, have a lot of other things come back out and you go, wow, I forgot about that. As you get older, I think that you are more comfortable with sharing your, sharing your past, sharing your history. Now with a lot of the Nisei getting into their 80s and 90s, there's a motivation for them to tell their story. The thing about uh, racism is it's so subtle at, at times that, especially in Seattle, that you know that there's something happening, but you can't articulate it, you sense it, you feel it. You go to a store, you don't get served, yeah. you know. Yeah, when, we were, when I was little, and yeah, it, after we first came back, that happened yeah. a lot. Yeah. You go to like Frederick and Nelson or Bonnerche downtown and you'd be standing there, you know, you wouldn't get waited on, so you kind of knew something was going on, but you know, yeah. what, what could you do? And I think you get used to it as a um, child that heard uh, people call me Jap and call you Chinaman and all these terms that they thought were derogatory. Mm -hmm. uh, you just you just become a little immune to it and you you brace yourself and yeah. you know you you get used to it. it just becomes part of your world. A lot of people now might say, "Well, that'll never happen now." You know, we would never let that happen now. It's just so ironic that anti-immigration sentiment is, is growing. The connections uh, to 9066 and what is happening now are eerily similar. If we deny them or don't try to make those connections, we are, I'm very fearful, headed down a similar road where 75 years from now, people will be having a conversation about what it is we did or didn't do uh, during this time. You can remember a time where, where a whole class of people taking away their civil rights 75 years ago and now you're talking about you know limiting limiting the immigration. You're categorizing them, you're stigmatizing them. It gives people that don't like other people the stamp of approval to say you know what I don't like you. Some people's civil rights will be taken away. Recently, when all the racism against Muslims and things start coming up, and we see it happening all over again, which is terrifying. 